Okay, let's do 10 players to watch for this upcoming season. By the way, there's a sponsor in this video. I chose these players based on... I have no idea. Anyway, let's start with Franz. So we all know his three ball dropped off this past year, but his scoring average still went up a little bit. His inside scoring being the main reason for that. Drives, drawing fouls, pick and rolls. The way that he finds these little pockets to hit defenders with like an extra crossover or an extra between the legs dribble or using Wendell's like second screen when Wendell screens his own guy or seals him, if you will, in the paint. And then he'll like cross over into that or he'll start a Euro step on like one side of the paint and then be damn near on the other side of the paint by the time he's releasing it or putting his shoulder into like a dropping big. Like Franz's inside scoring to was legit and not just with that. I mean, I think as a passer, especially on the screen actions, he looked good. It wouldn't surprise me if he got to like over four, four and a half, potentially five assists per game. Some of this depends on the Magic's point guard situation over the next few years. But yeah, as far as that three ball, I mean, the two years prior, he basically shot 36% on four threes a game. It's not amazing, but it's certainly cool. And his last year of college, he was 34% from three. Again, not amazing, but cool. He's been an 85% free throw shooter his whole career on some actual volume when it comes to free throws. So I think there's enough evidence to suggest it was just a weird blip three-point shooting season for him. We'll see, but Franz is still very good. He plays a lot of minutes in that great Magic defense. Next, we're going to go with Benedict Matherin, who I believe has been on this before, maybe. It's only his third season, but he continues to intrigue the hell out of me. He did have a torn labrum in his shoulder, so he missed the last leg of the regular season. He missed all the playoffs his previous year. We know Matherin can score. He established in his rookie season that he could be a battering ram going to the rim, drawing fouls. And in one of the last games he played before he went down, he had 13 free throw attempts against the Spurs. He's hitting like Chetty Osman or Keldon Johnson with spin moves. They got to foul him or he was just being aggressive in transition. And then a few games before that one, he had 30 something versus the Raptors, made a few like really difficult threes just out of isos or still got his drives on. He had nine free throw attempts in that game. So the signs are all there for him to be a real scorer. But number one, he's got to be more consistent with that stuff. Should also say he didn't get all the same calls in his second season. Two, he's got to become a better defender, especially because you need good defenders around Halliburton, and Carlisle's just in a spot where it's like, if he needs Neesmith and Nemhart out there to maximize the defense, then at that point it just gets a little tough for Matherin. He's still playing, of course. The second thing is the Pacers, look, they want to run Halliburton pick and roll. They want hit-ahead passes. They want Nemhard to be kind of like the second playmaker in this, although Siakam can handle as well. Like They want the ball ping-ponging around. They want anybody running quick little screens for Halliburton. They want you know, Halliburton Turner or Halliburton Siakam pick and rolls. And Matherin finding a way to fit into all of that and making those quick reads and everything, I think he's got to make strides with that too. So we'll see. He's talented. He can score. And him being a scorer off the bench, that's still a real role that can have a lot of value. Next, we go to my guy Shengun, who has not agreed to an extension with the Rockets yet, but I think it'll happen. Is the Shengun all-star season here? Finished last year 21-9-5. and I know they won some games when he was out. I don't care. They need him. His passing in the post, his passing on short rolls, his passing on any screen action he runs with Fred. That's all there. All of the pump fakes and hook shots and one leg fadeaways. Also using his dribble to like close the distance when a big is backing up off of him. It's all beautiful stuff with Shen Goon. I really think where it is now with him is about refining the edges of his game, if you will. The obvious thing is he's got to get better on free throws. He shot 69% nice this previous season. Him getting any sort of a three ball would be great, but we're three years in, it just hasn't really hit yet, so I don't know if that's a fair thing to hope for. The last thing would be either getting a little stronger or just getting a little better at drawing even more fouls. I mean, he was at five free throws a game this previous season. It wouldn't shock me to see him just make another jump there. I'm nitpicking. Shen Goon's very good. Again, he could very well make an all-star team this year. Before we get to the next player, uh, this video is sponsored by SeatGeek. Uh, The NFL season is currently in full swing. And if Drake May ends up starting at some point this season for my Patriots, and if the offensive line can protect him, then I could see myself going to a game and I would use SeatGeek, as I have many times in the past. We've also finally got NBA preseason in a little bit here. Everyone can use my code FUNKY10, F-U-N-K-Y, the number 10, all one word, and to get 10% off any tickets on SeatGeek, whether you're a new customer or not. And you can use it for sports, concerts, festivals, you name it. So if you want to pass on the sports, but you want to see Charlie XCX or Sabrina Carpenter in concert, you can do that. I imagine my audience would more so sway towards the sports side, but hey man, whatever you want. Seat Geek rates on a scale of 1 to 10. Look for the green dots. Green means good. Red means bad. No matter how many times you've bought tickets using Seat Geek before, code FUNKY10 is going to get you 10% off your next order. Seat Geek, code FUNKY10, 10% off. It's good stuff. Next up, we go to J-Dub. 
Is it crazy to say that we've already taken J-Dub for granted? I mean, in year two, the dude put up 19, 5, and 4 on legit great efficiency. Being good at basically every play type, whether it's pick and roll, whether it's drives, whether it's catch and shoots, handoffs, catching it on the move after an off-ball screen. And then defensively, whether he needs to guard a bigger body, whether he needs to jump into passing lanes, because of course OKC, they're very heavy on playing passing lanes, getting deflections, being just a typical help defender with his huge wingspan. And then the cherry on top of all of that is there are already signs that his pull-up shooting could be the thing that takes him to the next level. I should include step backs in that as well. He also has these moments of just being a bully on drives. Now, the last time we saw J-Dub was against Dallas in that round two matchup. Dallas's great defense that just did such a good job of packing the paint and for some of those games making OKC uh, kick out of more drives than they really wanted to. And J-Dub for that series overall, I would say was cool. Okay, he had a really good last game up and down throughout the series, at least as a scorer, which I think is fine because... I mean, it was year two against a great defense, and he definitely wasn't bad. And I decided to look at a bunch of his assists in that uh, series, because he had a very efficient passing series. I mean, he had 34 assists, seven turnovers. You got screen actions with Chet, whether he's using the screen or rejecting the screen. You got times where, like, he's getting the Luka switch and then just blowing right by him. Quick little screens with Aaron Wiggins to just throw something different at that great Dallas defense. And you can't just do that with anybody. Like, I think there's a world in which... While, yes, J-Dub is not going to be SGA with his ISO scoring, but having two reliable ball handlers in crunch time spots, specifically in the playoffs against a really good defense, like, yeah, I think J-Dub is on the path to doing that. Next, we're going to go to Deuce McBride. Yes, we're talking about backup point guards. Really like Deuce's energy in the playoffs. He was making some big threes for them, stepping into them with confidence, and he was taking threes at a real rate in the playoffs. It wasn't like he was just taking, like, one or two a game. And then defensively, the first thing I remember was just how hard he was playing, trying to stick with Maxi, fighting around screens, chasing him if it was an off-ball action. And of course, Maxi did have some huge games in that series against the Knicks, but I felt like there were stretches where McBride, when he was on Maxi, which was not all the time, of course, but when he was, it just felt like he was making him work for it. Sure, he and the entire Knicks team ran out of fumes eventually at the you know Pacers series, but I like Deuce, uh, I guess, yeah, I don't know if it's a certainty if he's ever going to be this, like, pick and roll orchestrator, play after play, making the right decision, skip passes, etc. off the bench for a team. But as far as defense, shooting, still giving you some ball handling, I like Deuce. He's not the reason you're going to watch a Knicks game, but when you do watch him, it's like, oh yeah, Deuce McBride's pretty good. And his contract is a hell of a bargain, to the point where it's probably an underpay. Now we go to a starting point guard, Darius Garland. He had a drop in production and efficiency last year. Also dealt with a jaw injury. I've already talked about, we will see how Atkinson influences the Cavs offense, whether it's higher pace, how creative can he get with using the bigs as hubs and, you know, Mitchell and Garland receiving more like DHOs as opposed to just simple pick and rolls up top, even if that's still going to be part of the offense. And also how much more can we get of some Mitchell, but I think especially Garland, like really flying off of screens to catch it on the move and then get into either a floater or a pull up because he's not a super high free throw guy. So it's just going to be more pull ups, floaters, that type of thing. And given how fast and just sort of slithery Garland is, I feel like he could do a lot with that type of thing. Not to say it never happens now, but you know what I mean. All right, next we get to someone who I believe has been on this before, Devin Vassell. Real quick lineup stuff. Wemby, Vassell, and Trey Jones together had a positive net rating of 9, which is insane because they won 22 games. But Wemby really is that good. I just want to see where the Wemby-Vassell two-man game gets to this season. There are some caveats there. Chris Paul, Trey Jones, and Stephon Castle are all going to be running screen actions with Wemby. And Vassell will benefit from that. He's been a really good catch-and-shoot guy for years. And I do like Castle a lot. I mean, pretty much everybody does. It's more so just with Vassell's shot making, if that guy can have like the elite two-man game with Wemby, that's what takes your offense to just a whole nother level. And funny enough, the last game that Vassell played last season where Wemby had 40 points, you can find some good two-man actions there. You know, you got like some pick and pops where uh, Vassell's like hitting Wemby in stride from mid-range to where he can just flow into like a 17-footer. A couple plays where Vassell's getting like a couple of like down screens out of the corner and then he's coming up to get like a handoff action with Wemby going and then it might be going like back to Wemby for a three or one play where Trey Jones is like the second screener and then Vassell's hitting Wemby for a lob and he's like really patient around the screen. Like Vassell did not come into the league as like a natural playmaker. He's had to grow into the four assists per game he had this previous season. And yes, if you were to uh, look at all the Spurs' offensive possessions this season, you're going to find stretches where Wemby had a passing lane and somebody on the Spurs didn't hit him. I don't think it's a coincidence that the best lineups were with Wemby and Trey Jones. But yeah, Vassell's good. What he put up last year, basically 19 and a half, 4 and 4, 58 true shooting. Next, we are going to go to Herb Jones, the one-man wrecking crew on defense. 
the Pelicans being a top 10 defense two years in a row. Yeah, there's some stuff between like the amount of threes that teams attempt versus them and how well they actually shoot on those threes. They are not a top 10 defense two years in a row if it is not for this man. And I could just leave it at that, but for the sake of the video, Herb Jones shot over 40% from three this previous season. Now, it was on three and a half per game. Let's not go crazy here. But I want to live in a world where Herb Jones averages like 17 points a game. He shot 47% on corner threes, which is actually kind of insane. I think it's really difficult to do that two years in a row, but I think it definitely suggests improvement. And then offensively, look, man, Herb, he will have these moments where whether it's like pushing it in transition or just kind of putting his head down and attacking off the catch, being a little physical around the rim, occasionally busting out like some gather step around there. Like there's reason to believe he could get to like 15 points a game. Okay. Like, yeah, the like pull up shooting, high end three point shooting, shot creation. Like he's never going to be like some big time offensive player, but 15 a game with this defense. I mean, just let me dream. Even if he doesn't hit it, he's still a massive positive. Okay. Next up, we got Jalen Johnson who was probably the best thing about the Hawks just blah season last year. Some more lineup numbers for you. Uh, Bogey, Trey, and Jalen Johnson in nearly 500 minutes last season had a positive net rating of 5. The defensive rating with those three together was good, which to me remains the biggest thing with Atlanta this year as they try to climb up from a 27th ranked defense last year. Of course, Jalen Johnson can help with that. He's a big body. He's athletic. And then offensively, if you were going to try to describe a big forward that could play with Trey Young... You would name a lot of the things that Jalen Johnson can do, right? And by that, I mostly mean if there's two to the ball on Trey and Jalen Johnson has it in the middle of the floor, he can put it on the floor himself and then create something for himself either as a drive or a kick out to a shooter. And then he can also catch lobs and the three ball this year was good enough, I think, to be intrigued about where it can go. It was like 35% on three and a half a game. And what you could see throughout the season was Jalen Johnson getting into screen actions with Trey, slipping screens. Quick little uh, flip plays where Johnson's got the ball and he's hitting Trey in stride. His handle is good enough to push in transition. It's good enough to attack closeouts also because, again, he's a big athletic forward. Sure, there are questions about what his ceiling is as a self-creator, but ideally he's just playing off of Trey Young all the time. So, yeah, uh, Jalen Johnson, he's already a strong overall player. Just looking to see where the next steps are. I mean, the, the easy thing is let's see if he can handle more three-point attempts. And in case I kind of just skipped over his defense, like, again, versatile defensive forward on top of all this. Anyway, for the last one, we're going to go with uh, Jaime Jaquez, who I said a lot of nice things about in my revisiting the Dame trade video. Jaquez has established that he can score inside. Some of that through cuts, some of that through straight line drives, some of that through up and unders in the paint and everything. I think really what it comes down to with him is getting better at that stuff, as easy as it sounds. I mean, like, look, he's a big wing, he's physical, that's how he wants to score, right? I mean, that's what got him into the league, even if in Miami he did have to shift like a little more to like, you know, dunker spot stuff and cutting from the baseline, whatever. But a lot of this is going to come down to the three ball and also, can he get his free throw attempts up? I would like to believe he can, given how often he's scoring in the paint. And he's obviously got the the weight to do it. I mean, he's like 220-something pounds. So we'll just see how all that goes for him this season. And he also had a quote like four months ago saying that the two things he's working on the most this offseason are his three ball and his defense. So you do like that, and being in Miami probably helps. 